Good morning, everyone. My name is Angel Tamala Reyes. Uh, today, with my colleagues, uh, Esteban Arias and Pablo Barquero, are going to talk about the IBM Cloud First Factory, uh, which is a three zone, uh, OpenStack based environment that we created at IBM to encourage innovation. I hope you enjoy. Uh, this is basically a story um, that is literally a point in time. Some of the things that we're going to be talking about today um, may not be relevant uh, today uh, based on the, the newer versions of, of OpenStack, especially with IceHouse. Ice um, but um, you know, our experience, I think, uh, I think it will be valuable to some of the guys that are here. So our agenda for today, uh, we're going to cover a little bit of background to talk about um, why we ended up creating the Cloud First Factory, how we got to that point. We're going to talk about the, the Cloud First Factory um, uh, itself, um, building the Cloud First Factory, the lessons we learn as we build the Cloud First Factory. Um, also, we talk about the upgrade, the upgrade process that we went through, um, the pitfalls, the, the good things, the bad things, and then we'll wrap it up with a summary. So, first of all, who here has heard about IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise? Just a few people, right? <laughs> so, about 2009, 2010 timeframe, IBM decided to create its first uh, public uh, uh, cloud offering, uh, and it was called the Smart Cloud Enterprise. Myself and a few other developers were tasked to create this offering. Uh, it was based on top of IBM infrastructure, IBM technology. Uh, but one of the problems with, with, with uh, SCE, I'll call it like that, but uh, SCE really never uh, had enough of an ecosystem. It never developed. Uh, one of the problems that we had with SCE was that uh, they were missing APIs for you know, critical resources, like you know, features like SCAS, for example. Um, some of the problems around SCE as well were that some things were not, uh, you know, most of the things were um, capable to do, you know, using the UI, but not necessarily the API. And today we know that everything is all about automation, automate, automate, automate. Uh, so you don't, you're not going to have a machine automate clicks on the screen, for example, right? So um, then in early 2013, um, IBM announced that we were going to support OpenStack and we're moving to OpenStack. Uh, why? Because, you know, a strong ecosystem. It's a Linux for the data center, essentially, right? Uh, at the same time, GTS, the organization that, I, that we work for, um, was looking to develop skills and experience uh, and also provide an environment for IBM and partners to be able to develop solutions um, and experiment, 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 and refine their solutions through a set of environments that we created for, for IBM uh, in the Cloud First Factory. Um, so the plan was, to, from IBM's perspective, was to take SCE uh, and adopt OpenStack on, you know, on, on, on the IAS layer, right? So we were going to adopt the OpenStack APIs and therefore um, uh, have the APIs that we were looking for that we didn't have. We would actually enjoy the ecosystem, the community, and so, and so on and so forth. So that was the goal. So. Like I said, you know, why OpenStack? Obviously, I think everyone here knows why. You know, uh, open source, uh, we have an Apache license. Um, uh, everything really revolves around elasticity, um, uh, scalability. Uh, the main goals here are scale every, uh, uh, share everything, distribute everything, um, and enjoy all of the goodness of OpenStack. That's pretty much well said. I mean, I don't, I don't think we can cover too much on, on this slide over here. but. Um, so, from IBM's perspective, we were looking for a very simple three-tier approach, right? So, we, on the bottom, we had all of pure flex systems from IBM. Um, the common components from OpenStack will manage all of those resources. And then, uh, on top of that, we would actually install or have uh, smart cloud entry and smart cloud provisioning and smart cloud orchestration, added value to the customers. That's all we were looking for, just adding value to uh, what, uh, what OpenStack had to offer. Again, uh, some of you already seen this before and you know, know this inside and out, but you know, just for uh, um, 
to cover well, you know, more ground, we'll talk about a little bit of the architecture. So as you know, OpenStack has several components that are very loosely coupled. Uh, you can pick and choose what components you really uh, want to use within your environments. Um, and in our case, we wanted to experiment with everything. So we install compute, uh, block storage, network dash, you know, the dashboard horizon, um, image management by Glens, Keystone, and also Swift. Right? So what is the Cloud First Factory? So all we wanted to do was to harvest the community. Our community was IBM internal, third parties, and the open source community. Uh, we were looking for offerings, services, components, and any asset that we can actually bring into the IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise. Our strategy was to engage the Cloud First, uh, the cloud first uh, factory projects. So anything uh, that was in the public, uh, anything that was for, um, anything within IBM essentially, right? Uh, eventually will become some sort of a uh, pu public offering. And we just wanted to curate all of the technology and all of those projects through the different environments we're about to create. Experiment, experiment, experiment. That's what really we were trying to do, is it's just allow people to come in and add their projects and continue to experiment and move the applications to the, the different environments based, uh, depending on how, you know, depending on development cycles. <clears throat> so, um, SCE, uh, the Cloud First Factory was sort of like the guinea pig for SCE. SCE was doing their development in parallel as we were trying to learn about a little more about uh, OpenStack. Uh, we wanted to experiment with better hardware. Um, we wanted to uh, upgrade our networking and also use OpenStack, right? SE was literally concentrating on porting all their stuff, but we wanted to learn a little bit more. How can we make it faster? How can we, cre how can we add direct access perhaps to, uh, to disks, for example, for some of our analytics work that we were trying to do? So we were literally enabling innovation that SE could not do at the time. So like I said before, we were looking to have uh, some experience around OpenStack, you know, our team had basically zero knowledge about OpenStack. Uh, but we had experience on S with SCE. Uh, we have minimal Python experience. And our team was split between the US and Costa Rica. Um, we, at the time when we began doing this work, we started with uh, Folsom. Uh, it was, that was the GA version at the time. And we installed our uh, OpenStack on top of RHEL 6.3. Um, one of the issues that we had was, even though we had this cool hardware, we really didn't have a lot of open switches in, in, in our racks, right? So we ended up having to, you know, we started simple, right? So we started with a single network node uh, with, the no, with, the, with, with the knowledge that eventually we would actually start to scale out and, 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 and move things around. Um, so uh, let's see, we added services as, as they were needed and we added compute, compute nodes as, as they were needed. And we started from a basic install. It was literally just like the install script. Right. So this was our hardware. IDPlex DX 360s. Uh, we had Mellanox um, uh, uh, Ethernet ports. Uh, we had uh, 100, 128 gigabytes of RAM, six cores, 12 uh, three terabyte uh, disks on each one of those machines, and also um, a uh, RAID, it's an M1050 controller on these machines. So it was pretty well stacked up. So, like I said, so here we're talking about our community, customers, third-party community, open source, business partners. The IBM internal community was research, GBS, GTS, software group. So we were looking for them to be able to start playing with our stuff, right? Here are the three, the three zones, integration, partner, and client. And we were literally moving from left to right. Innovations go in, and cloud solutions will come out. That was the whole purpose of the Cloud First Factory. So to talk about a little more of the process, right? So we had a constant inflow of, of projects coming into the, uh, the, uh, the integration zone. Uh, we will test it, we install it. People will go ahead and make sure that it works right. Uh, when they were good enough, those applications will then move to the partner zone. We would actually invite partners to work with us and begin to experiment with the, the applications that we have been working with. And then eventually, those applications will make it into the client zone. So you literally graduate 
those applications into possibly eventually going into production or the IBM Smart Cloud Enterprise. Some of the projects that we worked on, uh, uh, this is just a short list. Uh, uh, about 80, I'm sorry, 82% of the, the projects were uh, created by IBM. Um, GTA, uh, the software group uh, had projects like DBAS, virtualization as a service, big insights, Cloud OE, which is now called the um, uh, Bluemix, uh, Project Bluemix, right? Uh, and they were basically our, our biggest customer. As a matter of fact, we learned a lot about OpenStack when uh, Bluemix began really hitting our servers, right? Uh, we learned a lot about network use, how, avoid, you know, how to avoid uh, problems with network, um, how to avoid problems with sender, um, and pretty much uh, Bluemix put us through our paces. They were, you know, like I said, they were our largest uh, customer. Um, also, our third party uh, vendors were like Mellanox, uh, Travella, and also Fabrics with Cultura. So we did some video work as well, too. Uh, some of the work that we did around video, or even uh, uh, data mining, right? I'm sorry, uh, big insights or, or big data, um, led us into trying to figure out ways to make disk access faster. At the time, there was no way to have direct access to disk. I believe now, actually, we do have the capability. Uh, but one of the, the good things that we were able to figure out was that some of the changes that we were doing allowed us to be able to, be able to get about 80% performance to bare metal, which is not bad, considering that you know, you're working with virtual machines the whole time. Okay? So our requirements, right? Our primary delivery uh, was a public cloud. Uh, using industry-recognized uh, APIs, we needed to reach a, a big ecosystem, right? Um, our virtualization was KVM. For storage, we needed to have the ability to be able to connect to tape, local storage, object store, and block storage. Uh, we leveraged um, OpenStack to manage all of our infrastructure. Um, and a CloudFirst factory will provide operational insight into SCE. Again, we were essentially the guys who will go and discover what are the things that we could do with, with, with OpenStack, what was possible, and then, make the, you know, and then share what we learned to the group that was building SCE or SCE 3.0. So there we go again. Hardware, then OpenStack, and then, uh, you know, like I said before, like, uh, Cloud OE or Bluemix, some of the projects that we had, and uh, Big Insight. So our philosophy was the following. Again, start simple. We started with a single control node, network and compute, single cinders or uh, volume. Uh, uh, volume. Um, it's, our installation was based on just a simple script install. Uh, we used XCAD to deploy our, deploy our nodes, uh, move compute's dedicated hosts. Uh, we disable the compute control node and validate and add additional nodes. So uh, with that, I'm going to transition to my partner here, uh, Pablo, and he'll talk about um, how we were, you know, how each one of our zones were created and designed. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Well, now you know how, what was the mission of the Cloud First Factory, right? So how we did it. Pretty much we built up three different zones. So the zones that were referred in the previous slide become a physically separated zone, each of those with its own open stack installation and ecosystem. Well, what's the point here? We have one zone in, inside of our firewall, and that was the innovation zone. That's the place where the projects hit the first time in order to be created, in order to be you know, developed. So actually, we, we held some hackathons on that zone, and it was very productive. That was the incubation zone for the Bluemix project that we have already as an offering. Then, a yellow zone where we can enable partners to get in, right? So the projects, when it was ready in the innovation zone, passed through the integration zone, as we called, in order to some partner, partners to be able to see them and enable them and touch it and refine them, right? So after that, we got the client zone, which basically pretty much we enable some clients to see what we have been doing 
through this process of innovation. Okay, so the, jet, the blue zone was the development zone. The integration zone is where we actually test with some other uh, partners what our innovations. And the client zone is where, you know, some clients can play with it, can test what we have innovated in this zone. So, <clears throat> what about the blue zone? Well, this was the first one that we built, uh, pretty much our first experience, right? We built it simple. We pretty much have one control plane node. Pretty much everything runs there, except for the, uh, you know, the storage part of the OpenStack. We took out uh, Cinder and Swift at the beginning, but moreover than that, that control plane pretty much uh, runs all the processes of the OpenStack. Um, we relied as well on, on XCAT, which is pretty much a piece of software that enables you to control machines, to control hardware, right? Not necessarily through the network connection, but with a Pixie connection. So uh, we relied on the XCAT for some uh, purposes, such as remote installing a new node, remote building a new node. Uh, we had XCAT as a main repository uh, server. So <clears throat> we use it pretty much in order to have, you know, all our nodes in the same uh, versions, pointing to the same repositories, and being able to remotely uh, build up a new node from the ground, okay? So this was an internal zone. This was inside our firewall. So we didn't care that much about security, okay? So that's what pretty much our uh, blue zone, as we called it. What about the other two zones? Well, the other two zones represents to us a new challenge. Why? Because those zones will be heated through the internet, will be used through the internet. So we need to harden these zones pretty much. So what we did different here, and I will go through the different points that we face uh, with a public uh, cloud that we have built here. Well, pretty much we use some, we, we split some components of the, of the OpenStack control node on a separate virtual machine, okay? Pretty much Horizon and Cupid was moved to a separated virtual machine. The other services though, as well MySQL, yeah. The other services though remain on the single controller node, right? As you can see, we had no high availability at all. We have a single control node, right? So, in that control node as well, run the network part of, of uh, OpenStack. We relied on Nova Network. Remember, we started in Folsom, right? So we relied in Nova Network in order to do all the bill and tagging and all that stuff that is needed in, in this sort of installation. So, that was pretty much our yellow zones. So, as I told already, that was challenging in terms of we are given this OpenStack environments to be able to be accessed through the internet. So, what did we do? Using Nova Network, we did a, a bill and tagging. We didn't use a plain DHCP configuration. We use a bill and for each of the, of the uh, tenants or projects. We pre built those bill ons on the switches. We pre configured the switches, either, either the rack switch and the core switch. Okay? So we narrow it down. We didn't bring a whole stack of bill ons. We pre configured that on our switches. Of course, the ports started closed pretty much. So the policies was very restrictive or had to be very restrictive. The villain to villain communication as well was pretty much restricted. We used the security policies as well for the floating IPs. 
<clears throat> in that regard as well, we did not allow a huge amount of loading a piece, right? You know, maybe the customer will say, oh, I need tons of loading IPs, I need every virtual machine to be hidden from the internet, but that's not the reality of what we need, so, of what they need. So we decided to close it down and have a limit number of uh, IPs. So again, everything went through the controller node. There was the, no, the network node, and only one. Um, how do we administrate this, uh, these environments? Well, we had a jump gate, a jump uh, box, right, behind an open VPN, right? So the only way to administer this was using this VPN to hit the administrative uh, side. So, well, again, this is pretty much the picture of what uh, our network layouts uh, was built, right? Pretty much uh, the public network, we had a firewall. Uh, af behind that firewall, we have the controller and the network node, which was the very same node. Okay, we have the guest network, storage, and admin. Okay, the guest network is the BM to BM communication, and the storage network is, of course, for communicate with, C with Swift and Cinder. So those two networks was 10 gigabytes NICs, okay? So, so there were plenty of bandwidth for that. The management network was a one gigabyte uh, NIC. So this was our, pretty much our network configuration. What other challenge did we face? Okay, we don't want the external user to have admin rights. We don't want them to be messing up with our open stack or playing what they don't know about, right? So we build two portals, one internal and one external. The internal horizon was unmodified, was out of the box, and it was used for admin purposes only. So we needed to open the, the, the VPN connection in order to get there to administer the, the entire OpenStack uh, cluster, okay? The external one, we hide the admin tab, okay? We did not allow any external traffic to hit any administrative tasks through the portal, okay? What else we did? We reskin in the portal, as you can see in the picture, Right? We use our own style. We use a, a terms and conditions in order to, to the external users to get into the portal. We disable the image uploading. We disable the BNZ. Uh, we enable HTTPS, of course, for the external portal. And we did a vulnerability scan on Horizon as well before we put it in front of the internet, right? And it passed, it passed pretty well. So what else we did? The API, another concern, another thing to harden. So what we did, we implement a reverse, a secure reverse proxy for both, for Horizon and API. So all the HTTP traffic went through this proxy, hardened. Right? We moved the Horizon UE uh, to, a BM, to a BM, right? We didn't have it in bare metal, we had it uh, virtualized. So it allowed, allowed us in the future uh, when we can uh, you know, scale this to use or easily deploy a new Horizon VM and a load balancing in front of it. What else we did? With this reverse proxy, then we hardened it. We, as well, in the administrative point of view, had only one port to, to care about, right? You know, OpenStack services are placed in different ports, 
but we, tra we, we pretty much use this proxy for all the traffic, and then it just uh, sends that traffic to the proper uh, port inside our installation bed. From the internet will be only one port. Images on the internet. Well, you know, IBM, it's about compliance. We have a very strict security policies inside our company. Then we cannot allow any image to be placed there, okay? Internally, we have a policy which is called ITCS 104, which is pretty much a lot of rules that you have to apply in order to have a computer uh, hardened inside our company. So we needed to have those images, ITC 104, ITCS 104 compliant. We applied password policies. We prefer the SSH keys method in order to log in. Uh, only SSH was open on those images, right? We built or had previously a semi-automatic patch management system, and we integrate this infrastructure with that. <clears throat> we scan periodically all the IP addresses, and course, we disable the image upload functionality so the users will not be able to, you know, to put there any image that they want. The other thing that we needed to do in order to enable this environment to the internet, we needed to know who were using it, right? So we enabled a boarding process, okay? We enable a boarding process where, well, we use I, IBM Form Experience Builder to create this custom work, workload. Um, we enable single sign-on with some of the, of our, with the two methods of author, authorization that uh, we have, and I'm gonna talk a bit later about it. So, Pretty much what we did on this onboarding process, you come in, you register your project, and we create one special user with a special role that will administer that project. So that's a modification that we did on Keystone as well as in Horizon in order to enable this functionality. And that's what we did. First of all, Horizon has the supposition that the only one that will create, or at least at this point of time, again, I know that it has been evolved pretty much, but we started in Folsom. I need to re recap that. Horizon thinks that only the admin can create users at that point of time. And that's not the way that we can enable this on a public cloud, right? So, as well at IBM, we have two authorization app APIs, the IBM.com, which is external, and the W3, which is pretty much our intranet, our internal directory. So, we needed to integrate Keystone to those two authorization APIs. So, we took Keystone, we extended it in order to be able to delegate the authentication on that, those two APIs. So we did a piece of code and extended it, added the extension to our installation, and we were able to properly authenticate with these two <clears throat> uh, authentication APIs. So, what we did then in order to change this workflow or this assumption from the Horizon perspective in order to be able to create more users but not giving the admin uh, privileges to everybody. On the onboarding process, we created one user, which is the project admin. Then 
what we did is we included in Keystone this project admin role, and we added in Horizon a new tab that you can see on the screen, which is called project admin. So this new role was able to create users, but only in his own tenant. So with the onboarding process, we created a new project for this person that is being taken to the, through the onboarding process. Then this person will have, will be allowed to have the project admin role and then could add new users to its project. So we hardened it that way, the user access. We did not allow everybody to have the admin rights and we were sure that the users that we, they, are, they were creating was only for the proper tenant that they were working on, not having the entire access to all the tenants. So that was pretty much. Uh, now we go with the lesson learned. Stevan will be presenting that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I will go over a forensic uh, list of things that we learned and, and operation that we had to complete in order for the, the platform to run successfully. At the very beginning, uh, well, Angel and Pablo discussed that a little bit. We were using Nova Network. Uh, we didn't have the, the when, well, after we did the upgrade to Grizzly, we didn't have the, the needs to run Neutron, so we went straight with Nova Network. One of the first challenges we faced was the, the need. We, we were running on a, on a floating IP segment, and we needed to extend that because we, we, we were run out of IPs. And we kind of found out that uh, we needed a, an ad, ad adjacent segment. So that needed some tweaking in the routing. Uh, also, getting to the VMs by using the floating IP required some, uh, it, the, the VMs were not basically routing inside the guest network. So we had to get into the code and add the IP tables rules for the outbound traffic to NAT. Um, also, one of the decisions that we made at the beginning was that we were using Red Hat all the way, so in all the computes and the controller. So we thought, okay, let's go with it on the, on the Cupid side as well. So we were running Cupid on Red Hat. And that, at that moment in time, it was not that well tested, so we started to see some issues and some performance issues and, and some memory leak issues that I will discuss later. And that impacted the operation. Uh, as Pablo was saying, at IBM we have a set of rules for security and compliance. So we decided to go into a, a process of creating these QCOW2 images based on uh, specific needs, so disabling, uh, certain ports, and because we will, we'll, the, the images will be deployed by customers and they needed to, to make them as much secure as possible. Uh, also another issue that we had was the, using the Ubuntu 10 images, we, most, some of you might, might have faced it as well, the resizing of the root partition when, when occurring during the instance provisioning, it was not working properly, it doesn't resize. So it, it is due to an issue with the cloud init package. So we needed to uh, get rid of the Ubuntu 10s and, and we went to Ubuntu 12 images. For modularity tweaks, uh, we went into the discussion of uh, using VMs for services and splitting uh, horizontally the, the controller node. Advantages of that approach for those of you that use it, the VMs are easier to use and cleaner to upgrade so you don't have to be burying yourself with, uh, with bare metal. Uh, the moment that a VM doesn't stop, uh, stop working in, in stateless services, you just go ahead and, and start a new one. Uh, they are easier to move between hosts, so today you can have one host 
run it, sorry, one VM running on a host. And the moment that you need to do a maintenance window on that host, you just move it and the VM will follow or, or will continue working. Uh, that works for resilience as well. If you like that approach, you have to take into consideration that it will be an impact in, in terms of uh, performance. For example, things that are intensive in, in input output don't, go, don't do well in, in virtual machines. That is, that is uh, our experience. For example, uh, to be more, more specific, MySQL on a VM runs perfectly. The, the broker, the, either Cupid or Rabbit, it works well on a, on a VM. You just have to use the distribution that everybody uses. It, it works better. The Horizon, we ended up putting on a VM behind an Nginx uh, uh, package. So it performed very well. We had two, in fact. So at that, we, we, didn't, we didn't have the problem of, of losing the, the, the portal. Maybe tending to know and definitely know Swift and Cinder. And Glance, it depends on the workload that, that you run. Um, if it is intensive, I wouldn't recommend it because you have a bottleneck there, okay? Resiliency considerations also that, that we applied. Uh, for the operating system, we just had a simple RAID one. Uh, I have heard some conference here that do not go into expensive hardware. Let's say that these, these racks already had all the controller for RAID, so uh, it, it, it continued to be uh, commodity hardware, right? Uh, about the operating system, is it that important? You can reload it, fairly simple, really easy, but uh, the thing is that your operation will be impacted, right? And, and it doesn't take much. For the compute nodes, in terms of the rest of the, when you don't have centralized storage, we do recommend having a RAID 10, so the, you have at least the opportunity to recover from, from certain losses and the operation won't, won't be impacted. So, because at the end we will see a monitoring tool that uh, it's, it's start to telling you in advance so you don't have to get your boss on the, on the call or, or, or something telling you that uh, you just lost a compute node. For Glance and Cinder, we also follow that approach. So at the moment that we were doing the upgrade, we re-architect to do this Ray 10 configuration. So it, it was kind of a just-in-case architecture, right? Now we'll see upgrading. We, we went, uh, at that point in time, we went from Paulson to Grizzly. Uh, the very first thing that we found was that the, all the documentation said that upgrading uh, an in-place open stack installation was a, a huge amount of work. And it was very manual, right? So we decided to go on board with that. Uh, it, it's important to take into consideration that you have to be clear about what you are expecting to get out of the, out of the upgrade, not just because it's the greatest and latest. Uh, we had some, some features that we wanted, for example, the conductor service that uh, eliminated the, the, the access from the compute nodes to the database that, that uh, was impacting our performance. And also the opportunity to, to re-architect was a, a, a very good uh, reason behind upgrading. We split the control node into a number of VMs, like I already explained. We scale out the API services and we scale out a horizon. This is a list of uh, important facts that you might face doing this upgrade or, or doing from Grizzly to Havana. So the, the first is the approach. We strongly believe that in order to do an upgrade, an in-place upgrade, you have to rehearsal. You have to do it over and over. We, we create a test environment, not exactly the same, of course, and not with the same data as well. But uh, the, the main goal of this test environment was to go up, be operational, be functional, and go down. Because, 
of course, you want that in production, right? You, you want to get there, and the moment that uh, you face, start facing strange issues, and if everything just fails, you just go back, right? Uh, another challenge that we faced was the database schema. So it changed quite a bit. There were some new tables, new, just new, uh, new columns in tables. So this, this was kind of crazy because we ended up, for example, having a particular issue where uh, they introduced a new member role in, in, the, in the code, and it, the moment that you started to make it work, we faced an issue where when an admin added a new member role, it started to delete the rest of them just because the, the, the names were different. So that, that was very interesting. Uh, we also faced an issue where in, within the, the hypervisors, there were some uh, orphans, VMs, that when the, package, the new packages got in, they tried to start those VMs. And those VMs present in, in, in the hypervisor were not in the MySQL database. So the, the moment that Nova sees that the two lists are different, it starts going crazy. It was a manual process to clean up. You had to actually go into the tables, see what VMs were in, in, the, in the OpenStack database with a valid status, and compare that with the, with the actual inventory in the, in the hypervisors. Also, the DBSync on certain databases failed. Uh, you had to update it, the, the layout manually. And we had some issues with the VNC services. We uh, enabled those for certain environments. And there was an incompatibility with, between the OpenStack console OTH service and the, the rest of the services. OK. On this slide, important, uh, we tried at the beginning to do too much. We tried to do the upgrade. We tried to move glance, and we tried to move Cinder. We found that it was too much to choose, so we, we ended up doing the upgrade to the platform that is, not, that is just not a Joomla upgrade. You actually have to do a lot of steps. And then we did the glance and the cinder stuff. Um, we, important as, aspect of this, we integrate Horizon and, and Swift from the community version into the, into the EE version that we were running. So that was... Uh, a good step. Other than that, like it says, the upgrade process was straightforward. You just have to rehearse and prepare yourself for, for, for the issues that will come. They will show up no matter how much you, you try it. This is how the, the architecture looks today. I wanted to highlight that we use four NICs for, for all the operations. We split the management the images, the communications between VMs, and uh, the outbound routing. So it's, it's a reference architecture that, uh, for, for those of you who saw the, the soft layer and IBM uh, deployment, it's fairly easy to, to get there. Lastly, I wanted to mention the monitoring uh, for those that attended the previous conference. You can have, or you will know in advance, what is wrong with your platform, just using uh, regular checks. Uh, we use several, SSH, load, MySQLs. Uh, and there is a market for this, so you get uh, plugins to check almost everything. Uh, this is the way that it, that it looks. So the moment that you see a red uh, sign there, you will get an email, all your peers, and, and that's it. You, you, will, you will be informed. Okay, so I leave it to Andrew. Thank you, everyone. So in summary, right, um, again, OpenStack is still remains an emerging technology. Uh, one of the things that we found out throughout the whole experience is uh, error handles alert is not robust enough. Um, sometimes we find yourself uh, either receiving too much information, too little information. Um, also, uh, there, you know, as, you, as you know, the volume of RPC calls have actually increased from 
you know, from release to release. Uh, I, you know, we also kind of lost count already of how many messages uh, we get now. But uh, also, logging is not, more, it's not really optimal. Uh, one of the issues around um, scaling out is that each control node has its own uh, logs. Right? So trying to figure out what happened from point A to point B becomes kind of difficult when you have a lot of uh, compute nodes or kind of a lot of services running on, on their OpenStack. Uh, you, need to be look at, you need to be willing to be looking at code. That's one of the things that we, you know, that we learn, I guess, the hard way, right? Because uh, many times we just have to just step through the code and try to figure out why things break or why, you know, why things you know, behave the way they behave. And that becomes a little challenging. Um, let me see, one of the things also too that you know, that, that, you know that, that we really realize is that, you know, upgrade, as, as Esteban said, right, it, it's not really, it's, it's a straightforward process if, if everything works well, right? But it's not, it's not a single, it's not a single integrated uh, uh, step. You know, you can, you can go and do yum upgrade on some components, but you still have to go and do something different for the database, for example. Um, so not, you know, th we can probably use some improvement in that area, and I think it would be great if, uh, uh, we can begin to start uh, contributing to that into that part. Uh, let's see. So we talked about IP tables, uh, you know, IP table configuration, and flow and IPs. So um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but uh, I would like to open up for any kind of questions and from anybody. Yep. Do you guys experienced um, attack? Excuse me. Like the DDoS attack. They, they, uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, we experienced, it wasn't a DDoS, a DDoS attack per se, but I, I mentioned that we were working with Bluemix, right? And Bluemix uses a piece of technology called Bosch on the, on, on the background. And um, Bosch is pretty chatty and it asks a lot. So we got an instance where we were getting, I think it was about, uh, you're laughing back there because you know where it is, right? I think it was like about three or six, six nodes that were requesting um, every minute, every second. Uh, they were making about 10 requests per second to our system, right? So it really bogged us down and that sort of thing. But, you know, but out, you know, outside of IBM, nothing like that at all. So it was, it was our own boo-boo, in other words. Yes. Hello, oh, Trace with E-Trade. Um, you had mentioned making some or extending Yes. Uh, Keystone and adding some adapters uh, for on the authentication. What are the challenges you face with trying to integrate that code as going through upgrades? Uh, I, well, it, was, it wasn't bad, actually. Uh, I think uh, one of the issues that we ran into was because there was some, some code was probably, you know, some IP addresses were hard coded. But for the most part, it actually, it worked fine. It, it, you know, we didn't really have to make some major changes to the code. Uh, on our end. Were you so, able to make it modular or abstracted enough so that, uh, you know, the upgrades, when those come along, you're able to upgrade the bulk of the code, but then also kind of bring in your adapter? Exactly right. So, so it, it was, the code was not, the changes were not embedded into the, into the actual OpenStack code. Instead, oh, okay. there were, right, so we just brought in, brought in those, those adapters in, right? So you okay. modify your, uh, I guess, your configuration, right, of, key, of Keystone? Can, you, can, we, can, can you please? Turn? We, we actually developed our code in a modular way. So what we did we, was pretty much telling Keystone in the config file, use this uh, adapter yeah. to do the authentication. So we ended up uh, using the same interface in order to communicate properly with Keystone and doing a module uh, aside from the main code of OpenStack. So that's why the upgrade w wouldn't hit us at that point. I got you. Thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, how much were your teams, and how long did it take you to get from Costa Rica? fully adapting OpenStack into your environment? Say, say that again? How, how long? How, how, how big were your teams? How, how, many how big is the team? Um, well, you're looking at it. <laughs> So yeah, so it was, it, was, it was three people. At most, I think at one point we transitioned to somebody else, but, but it's, at most it was four people, but for the most part it's about like a t three and a half. Okay. Yep. Anyone else? Well, thank you everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a good thank day. You.